Good afternoon, everyone joining us from Japan, and good morning to the Nordics. Uh, thank you all so much for being with us today. Uh, my name is Nikos Karhonen, and I'm the Community Director at Nordic Innovation House, Tokyo. Today's webinar is about digital health opportunities in Japan for Nordic companies. It is organized by Nordic Innovation House Tokyo, Business Sweden and Innovation Norway and supported by Business Finland, Business Iceland and the Royal Danish Embassy. I will give it a few more seconds for everyone to join us. And while doing so, let me go through some of the uh, housekeeping items for today. Uh, as members in the audience, your mics and videos will be turned off throughout the presentations. However, um, if you have any questions for our wonderful speakers for today, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A button that you can find from the toolbar. Uh, we have enough time for questions after each of the presentations, uh, so please do use uh, this unique opportunity uh, to send any questions that you might have. Today's event is actually a launch event for a joint report on the digital health opportunities that we have identified um, here in Japan, and we will be sharing uh, those results with you. Today's uh, meeting is also being recorded, and within 24 hours of this event, you will receive all the material with accompanied links um, of different aspects that we will be discussing here today. Uh, but once again, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Before I go to the agenda of today, let me just give a very brief introduction to Nordic Innovation House. Uh, scaling the best of the Nordics is our mission. We work to support Nordic startups, scale-ups and growth companies in the five locations where we operate globally. We started in Tokyo one year ago, uh, but we have been in Silicon Valley, New York, Singapore and Hong Kong already before that. We are supported by Nordic Innovation, the Nordic Council of Ministers, as well as the Nordic Trade Promotion Offices. And with that, uh, let me move on to the agenda for today. Uh, we will kick things off with a keynote from Masaru Otsuka, uh, Head of Digital Acceleration at Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Then we will go into the digital health opportunities that we have identified uh, through our report by Magnus Bondel from Business Sweden Tokyo. And then we will have two exciting company presentations from Nordic digital health companies who have made it in Japan, who have already started their uh, market entry processes to Japan, one uh, through a video, and then we will also have Shimi Suzan from Synthetic MR joining us as well. We will end uh, the call for today uh, discussing our next steps uh, within digital health here in Japan and how you can access the report and all the supportive material that we have created for you and uh, give some more uh, details of the context and the Nordic support that we have here in Japan. Uh, once again, those of you who just uh, joined recently, my name is Nikos Karvonen, I'm Director at Nordic Innovation House Tokyo, and I will be uh, your MC for today. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to hand over the stage to our first uh, presenter, uh, Mr. Masaru Otsuka, Head of Digital Acceleration at Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Mr. Otsuka is an accomplished business executive who holds extensive global expertise in sales channels, marketing, operation, IT, e-business, and strategy. He has experience from Asia, Europe, North America, and Latin America as well. And his keynote is titled as Medical System and Healthcare Ecosystem in Japan. Otsuka-san, please, the stage is yours. Good afternoon. Yeah, let me share my desktop. Hi, um, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Masaroska uh, from Takeda Pharma in Tokyo. I'm going to explain um, about the medical system and also healthcare ecosystem in Japan, which include the digital health. Japan is the um, fastest aging country in the world. As you know, we have about 28% of the population um, is about 65 years old. And um, many countries in Europe, including Nordic, um, have around 20% um, um, with, with, with I mean, people are 65 or um, above. At the same time um, that the fertilizing rate started declining 
and it become uh, it um, become below 2.0 from 1975. 2.0 is a uh, um, baseline to keep the population. It did not start past a few years, but it started. It did started from 1975. The current fertility rate, uh, fertility rate is about 1.4 uh, last year. A working population between 15 and 64 years old, decreasing last nearly 40 years in Japan. The current situation is that two working generation people feeds one senior people above 65 years old. And the ratio has become more tighter year by year. This situation is very challengeable. On the other hand, it forces the country to become more efficient and have a higher productivity, especially in the healthcare both from the nation point of view and company point of view. The government launched uh, quite many policy changes um, to support the hyper-aging uh, geography and then the soften, um, soften the many generation in order to create a new healthcare solutions and also um, new healthcare businesses. Many transformation is underway in Japan. Medical system a schema in Japan is a little bit similar with Europe. The government uh, provides a public subsidies uh, to a national insurer and patient um, or a citizen pays insurance premium based on their income. Then patients receive a medical service from hospital and clinic. And they pay copay 10% uh, for all the medical costs for senior people and 30% for working generation. Hospital claims to a national insurer um, uh, to the less of the cost. Then um, receive the reimbursement. There are um, 8,500 hospitals, over 100,000 clinics, 68,000 dental clinics, uh, 56,000 pharmacies. In fact, there are more pharmacies and clinics each than convenience stores in Japan. Patient access to medical providers are quite different here. They are a general practitioner as a gatekeeper in US, UK and Germany and many other European geographies. After a general practitioner, the patients are referred to hospitals and expert doctors to receive a special treatment. However, there is no official gatekeeper in Japan and we call it free access. Patients can access to any clinics and any hospitals all over Japan. At the same time, there are some penalty to patient. They need to pay additional 5,000 Japanese yen to visit hospitals, but there is no additional cost to visit the clinics on top of the copay. Government expect that the, this incentive and also this incentive persuade patient to visit general practitioner firstly, then the transfer to hospital if needed. Clinic, clinics physician can prescribe any medicine. Large hospitals uh, have some formularies in, in the medicine uh, selection. 
central government and professional government are implementing a control in this situation, similar with Europe. On the other hand, promotional activities uh, by a pharmaceutical company can be effective to the doctor um, in clinics and hospital. To increase uh, uh, <coughs> efficiency in, 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 in the medical service, Japanese government chose uh, digital health as one of the strategic pillar and put quite many effort to promote it, including uh, regulatory changes and increasing reimbursement. At the same time, um, investment money um, came, comes from um, venture capital and corporate uh, venture capital into healthcare, um, including digital health. There are quite some M&A and also acquisition by a large companies. Here are some milestones last five years in digital health in Japan. In 2016, the first reimbursement to a wearable cyborg was approved. HAR, HAR is the name of this cyborg. HAR is a product of Cyberdyne, the company called Cyberdyne which is a spin out venture of a startup from a Tsukuba University. And the professor is the CEO of the company. In the same year, the first reimbursement was granted to a smartphone app called Join. Join is a communication tool between doctors in emergency room and expert doctors outside of emergency room and help uh, them to have a quick communication and reduce uh, um, medication cost. In 2018, the guideline of the telemedicine was cleared and reimbursement started. There are over 40 new entries in the telemedicine market by startup and also large companies. In 2019, the first IPO by a digital health company was shown. It, it is um, uh, that, that company called Medley. The stock, stock price is relatively stable uh, even now. In 2020, the first reimbursement was granted to a digital therapeutic, Cure Up. This is a smoking cessation treatment. And uh, the reimbursement to a telemedicine was increased in order to promote um, these things. Additionally, during COVID-19, there was again the increase in the reimbursement term medicine as well. So you can see that the, I mean, how much the Japanese government tried to promote the, I mean, um, term medicine. If I talk uh, about my company Takeda, yeah, we focus on uh, uh, some therapeutic areas. For example, oncology, GI, neuroscience, rare disease. These therapeutic, these therapeutic areas often require the solution with a real world evidence, a digitalized personalized care and RA diagnosis. For example, their disease has less than 20% of the diagnosis rate. Even um, many of the rare diseases are not known by many physicians. It often takes eight to 10 years till the patients are diagnosed. Some of the rare diseases affect the patient's life and it's important to be diagnosed earlier. We are looking for, I mean, this is type of RA diagnosis solution. Symptom in GI and also neuroscience can be very different among patients and the care solution need to be personalized. Um, then we are looking for the personalized digital 
this digital care solution. Yeah, if you have any good solution in this area, feel free to contact with me. Yeah, this is the end of my slide. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Otsuka-san, for your presentation. Very exciting milestones uh, that we've seen in the reinvestment strategy, and, and the government seems to have a, a clear direction uh, towards digital health. Um, also, very astonish astonishing number of clinics um, in Japan, as you mentioned. Um, if the audience has any questions for Otsuka-san, uh, please uh, use the uh, Q&A button uh, that you can find from the toolbar. Uh, while we are waiting, uh, let me ask one question myself. Um, with your uh, global experience, um, what are some of the main things foreign digital health companies should keep in mind uh, when they are interested in entering into the Japanese markets or partnering with Japanese companies? Yeah, I mean, the first three that the Japanese governments are always looking at uh, US market as well as European market. So, if you have an FDA approval or I mean European ap ap approval, that will give you a quite big ad advantage. Not only that you can gain a trust to uh, Japanese government as well as Japanese companies, also that it will shorten for you to get the approval in Japan. Thank you. That's that's wonderful advice uh, for our audience. Um... We have a question here. Um, Otsuka-san, are you doing any research development with EEG-based diagnostic technologies with um, ADHD, for example? Um, is, 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 is a question to me, or I mean, I mean, the general question to like, like in, in Japan? Uh, you can answer from, from uh, your own perspective, from Takeda's perspective, or, or reflect on Japan as well. Yeah, I mean that the, um, we have looking at the, um, all the devices and then the, I mean, I mean any solution all over the world, so that we know that the, what was approved, what's going on in US and also European market. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, we have one more question on the transition to digital solutions. Uh, what is the main financing driver? Is it to have the solution um, into the reimbursement system, or could it be something else? The, there will be uh, multiple ways um, to make a bit, bit business. Of course, that one of them is, uh, I mean, I mean, the reimbursement from a government. However, that uh, I mean, um, um, uh, it will take maybe two to three years, including smaller version of like a critical trial, as well as like a submission to a regulator, then they get approval. So you need to calculate this time duration. The second option or direction can be that you can sell or you can partner with a Japanese company. They can be a medical device or pharmaceutical, or I mean, it can be um, like insurance company. Yeah, then, that, then that, they will help you to go going through like regulatory approval or they bring the solution, your solution to the market even without like a, a government approval. I mean, that, that depends on the I mean, type of solution. Thank you very much, um, Otsuka-san, for, for your replies. And I think uh, in our next presentation, we will look a little bit into the business models um, as well. Um, but in the interest of time, I would like to move forward. There were also some questions um, regarding uh, the specific areas that Takeda is currently looking for solutions. But we will share all this material uh, with you after the presentation, so you can look into the therapeutic focus areas in more details. Uh, but for now, thank you so much, um, Otsuka-san, for your wonderful presentation. And let's move on uh, with our agenda. Uh, next, uh, it's my absolute um, honor to, to introduce you to my colleague, uh, Mr. Magnus uh, Blondell, who is a consultant at Business Sweden Tokyo. Uh, Mr. Blondell has over 15 years experience of growing healthcare businesses in Japan, both as a business consultant and in business development and marketing in the medical device industry. He started up Monluke Healthcare's business in Japan from 2003 and is currently uh, Business Sweden's healthcare lead here in Japan. Uh, he will present uh, the main findings from our digital health market research conducted in Japan in a joint effort of Business Sweden Innovation Norway and the Nordic Innovation House. Uh, please, Magnus, uh, feel free to start your presentation and uh, share your screen. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction, Niklas. It's a, an honor to, to talk to, to all of you at this, this occasion today. 
Um, before I share the screen with you, or while I make preparations to, to share it, let me uh, tell you a little bit about what I'm planning to talk about today. Uh, so basically, we've done a report on digital health in, in Japan that I will go through in part with you today. I will not go through all of it, and I will, will basically um, frame it in two different sections. The first section is will touch upon some, some of the things that Otkasan talked about earlier, give a background to the healthcare sector in a little more detail in Japan, and especially the overall developments in digital health. Uh, I will also then move into more specifically the opportunities that we've identified in Japan for Nordic health companies focusing on digital ones. And for a little background for the report that we're going to present today, it's mainly based on interviews that we performed in Japan this spring. Um, we performed a to total of 13 uh, interviews, mostly with Japanese companies, but also with the main Japanese ministries, including the Ministry of Health and METI. But we also interviewed um, company, um, <coughs> physicians. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. And in, in addition to that, we did additional research to fill up on uh, hard, hard figures, so to say. Um, and now I'm going to try to move, and I will not present all of, of the report that you'll be able to download uh, in a link after uh, this presentation. Um, so first to give you a short overview of uh, the medical sector in Japan and the healthcare business. So Japan is the world's third largest healthcare market, um, and it's actually still growing despite having a, a declining population. It's still growing at approximately four four percent per per year. Uh, Otskesan touched upon um, the comprehensive universal healthcare system in Japan, and I will go into that a little more. So what really makes Japan stand out, if you compare with other advanced economies, is that it has a very big population, and that combined with uh, a comprehensive universal healthcare system where basically everyone living in Japan is covered for healthcare. Uh, Otsuka-san also touched upon that there's free access to healthcare providers and that there are many healthcare providers in, in Japan. Um, most of the funding for healthcare is public funding. Um, so of course, medical expenditures are growing when you have a, an aging population and that's a concern for, for the government and they're trying to contain costs and we'll come, come back to, to that. Um, payments by the patient's contribution to, to the uh, medical system and healthcare in Japan is roughly 12%, so it's quite low um, in total. Uh, right now, medical expenditures are roughly 11% of GDP in Japan. And that's more or less on, on similar level as the Nordic countries, still lower than countries like the US, for instance. Uh, and the, the, the final ownership of, of the structure and, and re reimburse, is the reimbursement system in Japan that is man managed by, by the Ministry of Health. We have a lot of different types of providers, healthcare providers with different ownerships, different sizes, um, different focus on care. But what they all have in common is that is the, the reimbursement system that is managed by the Ministry of Health. 
So basically any hospital in Japan that provides a specific uh, category of, of healthcare, for instance, specific surgery, uh, let's say that you have a hospital that provides uh, total hip replacement, uh, they get reimbursed from the, from, the reinsur <coughs> from the reimbursement system exactly the same amount. And you could say that they compete on, on quality um, within this um, within the reimbursement. As Otkesan also said that there's a lot of healthcare providers in, in Japan. Primary care is primarily provided by uh, small units that you have out in, in the residential areas, we mostly call them clinics. Uh, so 100,000 of them. Most of them are very small, so it's just one doctor and a few nurses. Um, but as you have that many of them, so if, if you live in a fairly, in the big cities or even in small towns, typically it's healthcare is very close to you. So you don't, you just go there, you don't make reservations and you get to see, you get to wait a little bit, but you get to, to, to meet the doctor um, the same, same day in general. Um, And we also touched upon the aging population in Japan. So roughly one third of, of the population in, in Japan is over 65. Um, and Japan continues to, to grow. So we don't have the, the age pyramid in, in this presentation, but if as the schematicize, it would be a triangle in most Nordic countries, um, but in, in Japan, it's like a diamond standing up. So you have quite a big group of middle-aged people, quite a few older people as well, but when you come to younger people, you have fewer and, and fewer. Uh, and as you can imagine, healthcare costs are, are scoped towards the older people. Um, so roughly 80% of the healthcare expenditures are for people aged 60 or, or above. 45% um, of them are for people above, uh, <clears throat> above 80 actually. Uh, so as Hotkesson mentioned, Japan, the Japanese government is now focusing on uh, digitalizing the healthcare system. And we'll come into more details on, on this and where Japan is in the digitalization. But at this stage, I want to not mention that the government's main focus now in terms of digitalization is getting the infrastructure in place. Uh, digitalization, drug prescriptions, um, surgery, transplantation records, uh, records of health checkups. Japan is very advanced on doing annual checkups, uh, health checkups for everyone above age of 40. Um, also, one very important development in, in Japan that from a Nordic perspective might uh, you might be surprised that it's so late is that this year um, my number, which is similar to the personal identification number, is introduced in the healthcare system, um, which of course is a very important piece of in infrastructure to digitally manage uh, any healthcare records. So you might expect that uh, Japan is very advanced in terms of digitalization of uh, the healthcare sector. Uh, background that you have 
big um, kind of digital powerhouses like Sony and Nintendo in Japan. Uh, but to be fair, Japan is actually lagging in terms of digitalization of the healthcare sector. Um, since digitalization of the healthcare sector is something very wide, it's difficult to kind of point at one figure, but we found something that was, I think, speaks yeah, fairly well about the stage of digitalization is that in the Nordics, um, almost all of, or 100% of the healthcare providers, whether it's a physician's office or a big hospital, they have electronic medical records. In Japan, of course, this figure is a few years old. Um, it's only 30%, and it's the, the same with primary care providers and, and with large hospitals. Um, saying, to, saying that, the government is now uh, focusing on digitalizing the Japanese society, and uh, the healthcare sector has been um, singled out as a very high priority. Um, so Japan is now in, a, you could say, in a catch-up phase in, in digital health. And we believe that Japan will uh, catch up fairly quickly uh, as it's doing quite a lot of progress in digitalization of, in other areas, such as increase of uh, cashless payments, online shopping, uh, use of cloud services, just to mention a few examples. Um, and moving on to Nordic companies in digital health sector in Japan, bridging to uh, our, um, or uh, singling out the healthcare opportunities for Nordic companies in, in Japan. So we have a number of Nordic health tech companies that are uh, successful in Japan and have partnerships in with Japanese companies. So these are just a few examples. Sidekick Health, an Icelandic Swedish company, Kuala Life, a Swedish company, Nightingale Health, Finnish company, <coughs> uh, Onkyemology, a Norwegian company, um, and so overall, Japanese partners consider that uh, there's high quality in Nordic startups and that they have a good relationship with the public sector um, and that digitalization of the healthcare sector is, is at an advanced level in Japan. And these are just a few reasons for the interest from Nordic, from, from Japanese companies in, in Nordic health, health tech startups. Um, so, so far, I've been talking about the healthcare sector in, in Japan in general, uh, with some focus on uh, digital health. Now I'll go into a little more the conclusions uh, of our research in, in Japan on the different areas where we see opportunities for Nordic companies. Um, this slide might look a bit complex to start with, uh, but it's kind of a summary of our findings. Some of you will be very familiar with the terminology here, but others will not. So let me explain a little here. Um, so we try to uh, look at what type of digital health businesses that different types of uh, companies in Japan are interested in. Um, uh, we've grouped these type of digital health businesses in in uh, a few different categories. Uh, to start with, we have an, a very important category that we call complementary diagnostics and therapeutics. So it's basically digital services that complement and enhance physical products like 
medical devices or pharmaceuticals. Um, the second one is real world data, which you could say is um, a way of using everyday medical data to complement uh, uh, data from clinical trials. Medical imaging is quite easy to understand. Um, the kind of different ways of using imaging from, uh, from, 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 for instance, CTs, MRs, but also from pathology. Um, we think there are quite a lot of Nordic companies that have a strong offering in this sector. Telemedicine, um, you probably all of you are familiar with. It's something that has grown a lot in the Nordics during the pandemic, but also in, in Japan. So basically providing uh, patient care or consultation remotely, typically through video calls, but it could be all other digital solutions. And finally, uh, patient monitoring and, and wearables, things like um, the Apple, Apple Watch, for instance. Uh, <clears throat> so to summarize this, I mean, what, what are the different types of, of companies interested in? Uh, we find that uh, pharmaceutical companies are typically uh, most interested in complementary diagnostics and therapeutics. Uh, an explanation for this is that they are, uh, typically they have very successful pharmaceutical businesses and they're moving towards personalized medicine. And in terms of personalizing treatments, uh, it's important to be able to measure the result of, of a treatment re on <clears throat> real time, so to say. There's also interest from pharmaceutical companies in other areas like telemedicine, patient monitoring, wearables, real world data. So we think that complementary diagnostics is, is the top top category. Also with medical device companies, the situation is similar. It's primarily with complementary diagnostics and therapeutics that they're interested in, but also with in medical imaging. In terms of tech companies, IT, the IT sector, um, uh, we see, see the highest interest in, in real world data and medical imaging. Some of the, the tech companies are quite a lot in, in, in Japan have digital imaging hardware solutions of, of their own and are trying to enhance them with software solutions. Financial investors, there are quite a lot of them that are looking at uh, the digital health sector in, in Japan now. Uh, we also think that their highest interest level is for complementary diagnostics and therapeutics uh, areas, but also for telemedicine, patient monitoring, etc. And um, we'll discuss this a little for a little more detail perhaps uh, later on. But one of the reasons that there's such a big interest from complementary diagnostics is not only the move to uh, personalized medicine, but also that uh, a lot of yeah, the big pharmaceutical and, and medical device companies have profitable businesses and they see as a priority to kind of enhance them with digital solutions. Uh, and yeah, we'll come back to that a little bit later now. Um, We already talked a little about uh, complementary um, diagnostics and therapeutics. Sorry for changing back, back and forth here. Um, so what is driving this? I mean, there's several different aspects of this one is that tailor-made medicine is something that is growing very uh, yeah, rapidly and, and already is a very big big business and this really requires to have some kind of added um, digital services to be able to personalize the treatment. Um, and also, as I mentioned, that we might not have mentioned actually already, but 
uh, the companies that we talk to, they perceive that there's a high, hur high hurdles in Japan to get reimbursement for standalone uh, digital products. Saying that, um, and I think Trotskasan mentioned that there was a, um, an app that was approved stand for standalone reimbursement, uh, an app that helps people stop smoking. And that was the first one um, that got reimbursement as a standalone treatment. Um, but I think it's still, still the only one that has re reimbursement as a standalone solution. Just mention a few words about uh, medical imaging. Um, so medical imaging, um, it's difficult to find one thing to, to measure it, but we found that PACS, which is are the systems that are used to archive um, digital imaging, especially for CTs and MR, is a good indication of, of, of the maturity level here. Um, uh, it grew a lot after reimbursement was granted in 2008, but it's now fairly stable. Um, and you see a lot of uh, restructuring and mergers, business transfers in the in this sector, that I think indicate that it, it's something that will continue to Will, will be an important sector going forward. Um, a lot of companies are interested in providing add-on services using AI and automated diagnostics. Uh, I will In concern of, of time, I will uh, try to sum up a little bit, but was, just want to mention a few words about uh, telemedicine in, in Japan. Telemedicine is something that has grown a lot in many markets, in Jap including Japan during the pandemic. Um, I think we have Trying to find the slide here I had on, on that, if you bear with me. Uh, so before the pandemic, basically almost none of the hospitals were accepting online consultation, which is the very basic form of, of, of telemedicine. Today, we have roughly 15% of the healthcare providers in Japan that provide or accept online consultation. And We've had several different deregulations of this sector during the pandemic. It's not unique for Japan. Uh, it has gradually increased the interest from the healthcare providers, uh, but still reimbursement is lower for, um, for um, online consultation than regular face-to-face -face consultation, which is holding the development back a little bit. Um, Another part of, of telemedicine in Japan that we have quite a few new private entrants, uh, new companies, tech giants that are investing in telemedicine. Um, sometimes they provide services that are not reimbursed and financed in different ways. Uh, for instance, by having kind of a subscription service where um, an insurer or uh, your, um, your employee pays for these services. Um, so we call this B2C to B business model. Um, so just to try to um, opening up, before opening up to, to questions to summarize, Japan is a very big uh, healthcare market. It's the world's third largest has a rapidly aging population, which is driving um, um, a growing healthcare sector. Japan is a fairly, in a fairly early stage of digitalizing its healthcare sector. 
but it's a very high priority for the government. Um, we've identified a number of different um, opportunities for Nordic digital health companies in, in Japan. And perhaps the most important one would be in complementary diagnostics and, and therapeutics. Okay. Thank you so much for listening so far. So I think, I mean, it's time to open up for, for questions here. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Magnus, for running through the main findings of our report. As you can all see, there is a lot of information and a lot of data available. And uh, we will share towards the end of today's presentation how you will have um, access to it. But uh, let's take some questions and answers. Please feel free to use the Q&A button. Uh, we have one question. Um, how can we manage language issue if we bring digital solutions to Japan? Will English be usable? Yeah, I mean, there, there are many aspects of, of that. So, I mean, one aspect is if, if you, for instance, have an app, you would need to localize it to be able to have it used in, in the Jap Japanese market. So that's one, one aspect. Um, and it's not only just localization of language, there will be other aspects to kind of customize the product to uh, the reimbursement system and, and the general landscape in, in Japan. The other aspect is communicating with your business partner in Japan or your colleagues if you set up a subsidiary. Um, so it depends. I mean, you have uh, internationally minded business people like Otsuka san who has, uh, yeah, large exposure to overseas businesses and, and experience. But on the other hand, you have a lot of um, other companies and other, other people who are not familiar with communicating with in English. And, and here, um, bo both of these aspects, and kind of especially in the business development phase, I mean, also at the, the TPOs, but also Nordic Innovation House have, have an important role to bridge language gaps and cultural gaps, but also time, time zones, so to say, and business culture. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question, uh, question and, and also for the answer. Uh, let's take another one. Uh, thank you for a really good presentation. Are you seeing telemedicine online visits uh, being approved in home care, home care services in the Japanese markets? Uh, yeah, so telemedicine is actually used for home care or um, in, 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 in Japan, or it, I mean, by definition, it's, it's all, almost all, 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 always home care, but I guess one aspect would be to have um, uh, elderly, elderly care in, um, in nursing homes, for instance, it's being used. So we, we had an interview with a nursing uh, home operator where they use te telemedicine. So typically they, they need to have someone to assist the patient with the, the online tool, so to say, whether it's an iPad or, 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 or laptop, et cetera. But it, it's used in that sector. Is that an answer? Yes, um, thank you. Um, another question uh, regarding hiring. Um, is there a large base of IT individuals to hire in Japan if a subsidiary is set up? <clears throat> yeah, so actually when setting up a subsidiary, in, in Japan, uh, one of the, the main topics of discussion and an important yeah, area of preparation is hi hiring people. Um, as you see, Japan has an aging population and that means that for each year you have fewer people entering the job market. And also there are language issues. So you have just, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, not everyone is comfortable in speaking English in a kind of working environment. And that means that there's, yeah, there, that, that's one of the challenges in setting up a business in, in Japan to hire, hire people that you know, have language skills, but also business skills. So getting both is, is important and, and can be a challenge when you're starting uh, afresh, so to say. Thank you for the question. Um, we still have a few more minutes if, if the audience has more questions for Magnus. 
Um, let me ask one myself. Uh, so we have now identified certain opportunities. Uh, so perhaps our audience would like to know, um, how can these Nordic digital health companies meet with these relevant Japanese partners? Are there certain trade shows or, or how does that networking typically take place? Um, I know we're living in a, in a strange time, but uh, if you have any insights on that. Um, I mean, I think we'll, we'll come back to that later in, in the presentation today, but one, one of the avenues is, is using the, the services and events of, of the Nordic TPOs in, in, in Japan. So we try to support uh, Nordic companies to enter the Japanese market and, and to partner with Japanese companies. Sometimes it's, it's about investments, gathering investments for, could be related to market entry, but something else. At other times it could be a partner as a distributor or a localization partner in Japan. Um, so we can just taking the example of Business Sweden, we can support you both in, in ta with tailored events that we'll come back to later today, but also with tailored business development and finding you know, and providing um, yeah, tailor-made projects for you to find your, your partners in, in Japan. And of course, <laughs> Unfortunately, right now, travel is restricted. Uh, so for most of you, you won't be able to travel to Japan in, in, yeah, in, in the next few months or even. And, and um, partnering online is, is possible, but some of the business development and especially the, the negotiation and um, relationship building can be a little bit challenging when you don't meet face to face. So, um, but please, we, 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 we're here, here to help you in, in the Japanese time zone and speak, speak the languages and are, are familiar with many of your business models. So please, please re reach out to, to, to the TPOs and, and to Nordic Innovation House. Thank you for the question. Um, and, and for the answer, uh, perhaps also related to that, I think this is a rather large question, but um, what would be a go-to-market strategy? Go to hospitals or distributors? Um, this might, of course, differ quite a lot depending on the solution, but um, if you have any examples that you can share, what would be a kind of an entry point or, or those first partners in Japan? Yeah, so I think that with most of the digital health solutions, in, but we would see that they require some kind of localization in, in Japan and, and, and most likely with support from a business partner in Japan, but it could also involve setting up your own subsidiary from scratch in Japan. But I think in general, um, the first part would do, do, to the, do a, bis, a partner search in Japan um, that would help you with the localization and, an initial launch of, of the products in, in Japan. Uh, an alternative would be to, if, if you're very ambitious and have, have done the market research, perhaps with the help of, of the TPOs to look at setting up your own subsidiary and direct business in, in Japan. And we have an example of that further on. Synthetic MR is a recent example of the Swedish digital imaging company that is setting up their direct business in, in Japan. Um, but typically you would not be able to launch directly selling to, to product to, to hospitals without any localization and, and, and business partners. Thank you for the answer. Uh, let's take one last question. So um, both you and, and also Kasan mentioned that digital health is highly on the agenda of the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare. Um, is there anything in the horizon uh, from the governmental perspective that you are keeping a particularly close eye on? You mentioned, for example, the, the My Number uh, system, but what can we expect uh, from the governmental side in the upcoming years? Yeah, so something that we can expect very soon as is a healthcare portal that all the citizens can access. Um, and to get information about your own health, healthcare records, et cetera. And it's something that has been introduced in, I think all of the Nordic countries and in, for instance, Finland, it's one of the, I think one of the most popular online sites actually, uh, checking your own 
health information and getting access to health resources. And this is a way for, for the government to kind of um, give, give the citizens benefit from digitalization of, of healthcare. Um, so sometimes you have concerns about privacy in Japan um, in the digitalization and use of, of my number, for instance. Uh, and this is seen as a way to kind of turn the discussion around to, to see, look, look at all the good things you get once we start digitalizing the health, healthcare sector. Um, and I think that once these, the health portals is, is up and running, you'll see ecosystems of new services to enhance information delivered through these, these portals. Um, think will generally kind of grow the interest in, in the sector among the public, but also among uh, companies, both um, overseas companies and Japanese companies. Thank you so much, uh, Magnus, for sharing your insights uh, with us in today's webinar. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, we will move forward. So thank you again for your presentation and sharing some of the insights from the report. Um, next in our agenda, we will hear a couple of Nordic stories, uh, Nordic digital health companies uh, in Japan. Uh, we will start with Koala Life, uh, CEO Dan Pitulia. Uh, Koala Life is a Swedish uh, medical developer on a mission to digitally transform the field of cardiac diagnostics to help win the battle against world's leading cause of death, the heart. It's about predicting and preventing uh, cardiac disease powered by smart algorithms and the individual. Uh, Dan himself is a serial entrepreneur with extensive history working with Japanese companies and um, as he is currently in the United States, uh, today we will hear a short video message from him and about their cooperation with uh, Asahi Kase. So I will just start the video, so just give me a second here. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak at the digital health market opportunities in Japan. Um, we are a uh, digital startup company in Sweden that produces a uh, digital um, heart monitor for uh, detection of AFib. Uh, the monitor looks like this. It's connected to a smartphone and an app, um, and it sort of um, rides on the digital wave of uh, having um, using um, other resources like app, telephones, uh, iPads, and so on. I will give you a very brief presentation on our company. Here it comes. So Koala Life is a um, digital uh, startup company. We have a heart monitor and we're leveraging new technology. Uh, it's a Swedish industry leader in digital health, uh, especially in the cardiology area. Uh, 15 years of R&D came up with a very nifty product um, uh, addressing a huge unmet medical need globally. We introduced in Sweden a couple of years ago. We then uh, were approached um, uh, almost two years ago by Asahi Kasei in Japan. Um, uh, and as many Japanese companies, they had really done their homework and um, uh, investigated the market, the suppliers and the players. Uh, they contacted us, and after a number of email exchanges, we then um, they were invited to come to meet us in Sweden. They sent four people over, um, very diligent uh, meetings. We went to see a clinician. We went to see a cardiology clinic in north of Sweden. They went to see our um, subcontractor in Estonia that actually makes the product. Uh, and in general, you can say that um, doing business with the Japanese means that you always meet the partner that is hugely well prepared. They've really done their homework and when they come to meet you, they are probably or have already done the deal, at least in their own minds, because otherwise they wouldn't send four people across the planet. Um, very conscientious um, and very well prepared. Um, and Koala Life um, is the fourth company that uh, I am uh, heading up uh, that has interest in Japan. Um, our current interest, of course, is with ISI Kasei, where they are in conjunction with the university uh, doing a clinical trial with our technology and some of their own technology, combining it in order to look at an even larger patient group than we are addressing with uh, atrial fibrillation. So they are namely looking into heart failure. Um, 
my experience with Japanese people uh, and Japanese companies is that they are always very, very well prepared. They always dig into the details. Um, sometimes they are a bit picky, uh, we Swedes would think, uh, but it's only because they are so quality conscious. Um, and um, as long as we all understand what we're trying to achieve, uh, that cooperation works out well. I have built three different companies with large direct operations in Japan, um, and the fact that we went direct made them successful. We populated it with Japanese people, of course we did. Uh, we weren't like the, you know, the ugly foreigner who only sent our own people in, but you know, we want the Japanese people for the Japanese market. But I spent myself a lot of time in Japan understanding what they wanted and above all, how they wanted to do it. Maybe not exactly the same as we want to do it, but as long as we could agree on the end goal, it has worked out really, really well. So whatever ideas you have, whatever strategies and aspirations you have for Japan, it's a hugely interesting market. And at face value, it looks a bit complicated, but it's not that complicated. Um, uh, they do their homework maybe a little bit more than we do. Uh, they prepare a little bit more. Um, and above all, they take notes of everything and they read them back to you, even six years later. Uh, but I have worked with Japan since 1988. I've always enjoyed it. Uh, and if there's an interesting market for medical devices and digital health, I can assure you it is Japan because they are quite advanced in certain areas of digitalization and personal uh, uh, handheld equipment on which they can consume health data and other data. So I wish you all the best of luck. I hope our uh, um, entry into Japan can serve as a precursor for other people. It is a daunting market, but it is a very exciting market, actually. Um, you know, I can only recommend to everybody to go there. I hope it works out for everybody. Thank you for listening to me. Bye. Thank you uh, very much, Dan, for the video uh, message. Uh, he has also kindly mentioned that if any members in the audience would like to be connected, um, that is a possibility. So please feel free to um, reach out to us after today's webinar uh, if you would like to hear more about Koala Life and uh, their expansion strategy uh, into Japan. Um, next, I would like to present um, another uh, speaker representing a Nordic digital health company. It's my honor to introduce you all to Mr. Uh, Yusuke Shimizu, who is the head of sales in Japan for Synthetic MR. Synthetic MR is a Swedish company uh, which develops innovative analysis and imaging solutions that can speed up MRI examinations. Uh, Shimizu Zan will tell us more about their solution and his experiences representing Synthetic MR here in Japan. Uh, Shimizu san, uh, if you are with us here, please feel free to uh, share your screen and put on your video and microphone as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, if you are able to hear me, please we respond. <laughs> <laughs> we are able to hear you. We are not able to see All you. Right. Do you have your video on? Okay. I have my video on. However, though, let me see. Could you see my screen? Though? Yes, we're able to see your screen. Okay. So let me just uh, start off. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you, Nicholas. And thank you for Business Sweden to giving me the opportunity to share my experience uh, here in Japan. Uh, my name is Yusuke Shimizu. Um, I represent uh, uh, Synthetic MR, which is one of the uh, digital uh, software uh, for the MRI uh, uh, medical device here uh, in uh, globally, and um, yeah, I'll you know I just received this invite uh, last week, so I hope that I'll be able to provide you with some insight and some knowledge on how to enter this market. So let me just start off. So about synthetic MR, very simple. So this company was founded by Dr. Marcel uh, nearly about 14 years ago. And this company is originated from Linköping, Sweden. And really it develops a software which has a medical image science and visualization that is dedicated to MR. So that's why the company is called the Synthetic and it's MR. 
Uh, recently years, you know, Focus has been developed great technical product that differentiates us against our competitors. So sign partners agreements, of course, keep working on the partnership we now have the Japanese vendors. So um, this uh, company is, uh, in a way, it's a startup, but in a way it has been very successful and has been growing year over year. And um, now we have uh, a partnership with all the known uh, MRI manufacturers, uh, starting from GE, Philips, and Siemens. And now we are working in our way through to the domestic uh, uh, vendors such as uh, uh, Canon, which usually used to be known as Toshiba, and also uh, with uh, Hitachi, which also used to be known as Fujifilm. We have a lot on our plate, and there's a lot of uh, opportunity here in Japan, as you always, uh, you all know. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of work that needs to be done also. So what makes it unique, just briefly, is that uh, our software is a very unique, uh, it has a very unique technology. I don't know how much of a MR uh, scanning and, you know, uh, the audience, the audiences are familiar with is that, as it says on this description, is that the one scan can make it all. Um, some uh, methods are it, well. There's a unique method that you could. Uh, uh, there's a unique method that the synthetic MR offers, which is called the MDME, multi echo, multi delay method. This is a sequence that is has to be implemented from the machine. And with that unique sequence, this is able to peak. So usually uh, several years ago, it, it took with a one scan, it took a couple of minutes and overall it ended up uh, scanning time about overall 15 to average 20 minutes. But now you could have that in six minutes. And within six minutes, there is a certain, uh, you know, uh, contrast that you can be able to achieve. And also there's a more insight that you could be able to examine and diagnose. So with all, you know, on top of that, there is a, a, a huge benefit. And uh, from, a, from a user perspective is that they see a lot of potential for this as well. That's why uh, the headquarters have decided to enter this, company, this market because they have a lot to offer. As you can see, MR, a synthetic MR has been very, uh, uh, I mean, very present uh, globally. And there's a lot of study cases that has been conducted uh, with the usage of our technology because si since it's so unique is that they have a lot of attention and attraction as well. So a lot of known hospitals and universities such as from Japan, Nintendo University is one of those uh, very famous in the uh, the MRI modalities, and uh, one of the uh, hospital, uh, one of the professor, Dr. Oki, was able to really uh, show that and expand into this market. So, really, um, getting a KOL key opinion leader here in Japan is also one of the uh, shortcuts that uh, makes uh, your company or your agenda, you know move forward most more uh, faster than, um, than just doing it individually. So um, I'll give you some of the experience that I have seen. So let me just share that with you. Basically, as what uh, Magnus has also said that Japan is, as we all know, one of the uh, uh, huge market in the world. And uh, as what we understand for today is that we have, as of MR itself, we see a lot of uh, nearly about a 10,000 uh, units of MR in, in Japan it's itself. Now, this is uh, a very huge number if you compare the population. So um, we, see, we certainly understand that there is a, a huge potential in this market. But also the yearly increase is very rapid. The cycle of the MRI 
uh, is very rapid. So this is something that we also have identified and we also have studied. And I uh, understand that before going into this market, we really need to identify the, the current status before really going in. So there's a lot of homework that needs to be done. So this is something that we have already done. Uh, went to each and every uh, you know known possible uh, you know key opinion leaders if these information was authentic. So there's a lot of work you know before preparation, you know, before coming into this market. So these are the information. It's a very general information, but very, it's important. Now, the information that I'm just sharing with you is just the general market information, but also we need to understand about what are the trends and what kind of applications are very focused and what drives the market itself. Uh, so basically I've listed down that it, this is a uh, application area and it gives you an example of global, but actually Japan is not that much of a different compared to what it is from a global perspective. But what it's, you know, the trends and the drive forces, this is also a very important objectives that we need to really understand before going into the market. So is Japan looking for more of a simplicity, efficiency or, or quantification, what are they driven? What is the trend? What makes them very, uh, you know, uh, attractive? So we came to understand that, as we all know, Japan can be sometimes very picky. So uh, they want it all. But if you really look in into very closely, we discovered that simplicity will be the key. So this is the area that we are really focusing on. So we need to really have this studied and really examined before, you know, we have the general information, but we really need to understand what drives this market. Again, what needs to be identified and recognize what is the advantage and disadvantage before entering this market. So if I give you an example of synthetic MR, uh, fortunate enough, synthetic MR has been already been recognized in this market since 2015. So we have a six year advance uh, compared to any uh, market. So we were already there six years ago because uh, the, since the uniqueness of the technology that we hold was attracted in a very global scale, that voice came into this market and then was able to spread the the uh, the uh, uh, the product for itself. So, but also um, the other the other thing is that uh, we what we recognized was that we didn't really see that much of a com competition in this market as well. So what ma what made us more comfortable in that sense was that we were able to take time and really seek through because there wasn't you know, a similar product out there in the world or in this market. And another advantage is that we were also you know, saying was that uh, this is, again, it is the, a huge market and then there's not much of a competition. So basically uh, we are very fortunate and uh, we can really seek on what, again, is the way how we should play. So we, again, going back, is that we had the time to do so. But also the very important thing and the very important elements are that, are we able to sustain this? Are we able to really grow this business here in Japan, given the fact that, you know, there's not much competition, you know, sometimes competition is very important. You know, we have some, you know, uh, analytical, uh, studies that we conducted, but we, just, we have uh, understood that there is a huge potential there as well. So we have all that advantages, but also uh, on the other hand, this is something that we also have to keep in mind is that the, what are the disadvantages? And then, you know, sometimes that is a more of a focus rather than an advantage. So I would like to share my disadvantages uh, to our audience today. I know that uh, the language, issue was uh, was brought up earlier uh, with uh, uh, with the audience uh, from the audience question 
And uh, I would not uh, kid you. Yes, there is. The reality is that language is uh, sometimes a very uh, difficult uh, uh, way because uh, not only within the language, the way how they conduct business and the methods are very different. And uh, to be honest, it really has its own local way of conducting a business. And uh, sometimes it's a very complex. Uh, therefore, it's, it's very hard to understand and digest, but you have to really grow with it and you have to kind of understand it once you get the idea of the, how the business is conducted here in Japan. So that's why on the very top, in our case, it's also a niche market, but it will require a longer time to uh, adapt into this market. And another thing that I have brought up is the service and support. This is a very important subject here in Japan. This is really one of the key deal breakers, if I were to say. Service and support, I would say it's a must because uh, if I were to give you an example, in our case, as I have mentioned, that we work with our vendors. And so in some cases, we rely on our vendors. However, though, from a user perspective, they will always come to us as a first contact, meaning that because what we are offering is we are actually providing this product, not our vendors. So we need to represent ourselves, uh, not only from a uh, support wise, but also hands on and somebody who can rely on. This is a very important uh, subject and it's very important element uh, before really going into this market. So uh, really given this structure, this is something that I have experienced and there's a lot more that I need to work on and what we need to work on. So uh, it's, a, it's a still continuing journey for us as well, but we are certainly seeing a lot of uh, uh, positives and results here in Japan. So for those who are you know, wishing into coming into this uh, market, you know, I wish you all the best. And I hope that your business will you know, go as what you have planned. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Shimizu-san, for your insightful presentation. Uh, very interesting tips about finding key opinion leaders, uh, perhaps collaborating with universities. And also, I'm very happy that you brought this uh, service and support item. Uh, it's, uh, as you mentioned, a very important uh, aspect here in Japan. Uh, may I ask you, Shimizu-san, if we can uh, try to get your video on as well? So if you turn it off and on again, we can see if, if it's uh, working. I am not sure why is my video not. I, 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 uh... That's no problem. No, uh, okay. Yes. I think uh, we can, uh, we can, we can move move on to the Q and A right. as it is. I. I, I uh... Absolutely no problem. Um, so you, you mentioned that uh, you still have a long journey for Synthetic MR in Japan. I'm, I'm curious to know uh, what are your, your next steps and, and where do you see the future of, of your service here in Japan? Yes, thank you for that uh, question, Nicholas. First of all, we are currently uh, seeing a lot of results uh, by uh, what I mean by results is that we have started to really uh, our sales growth has started to show some result, uh, some positive. Uh, however, though, uh, in terms of resource, and as I said earlier, that service, we are not really sorted out yet because there's a lot of complexity behind it. So we are in a bit hesitating mode on how we should really continue on, um, you know, supporting the local. We, we are able to, uh, support the big hospitals, but not the locals, which we are we we need to engage into as well. But given the the resource and given the fact that dealers have to recognize 
more and more about what we are offering. That's some of the training and the hands-on training that we have to really conduct. But again, given the circumstances of this COVID, uh, we're not able to really uh, you know, send over a lot of people overseas and overseas not coming. We have to do it remotely. So uh, we are still trying to figure out how we can make it more productive in those senses. Thank you uh, very much for, for your reply. Um, let's take uh, one last uh, question. Uh, so as a representative of a Nordic company in Japan, uh, do you face any challenges with different business cultures in your everyday work? And if you do, uh, how do you deal with them? Uh, for example, let's say communicating expectations with the headquarters. Well, uh, basically, uh, the communicating with the headquarters is, for in my case, there's no problem because uh, we I have worked with the uh, a Swedish company before. And so in my experience, I have not much seen any difficulties from that perspective. However, though, for those who are about to work from that sense, I think that uh, people in Japan see it differently and uh, the ethics of the workflow that, you know, is very, in a way, very different. So before really, uh, hiring or appointing a person here in Japan. I think the, these, uh, uh, how would I say, um, we, you need to really uh, have that clear, crystal, crystal clear before really uh, appointing somebody here in Japan because work ethics and, you know, sometimes it's very different. So uh, that is an advice that I can provide. Yes. Thank you very much for that. I think it, it reflects on, on Magnus's thoughts uh, on the earlier discussion about hiring, hiring for talent in Japan. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shimizu-san, for your wonderful presentation and sharing uh, the story of Synthetic MR uh, to our audience. Uh, before we close up, I would like to move on to the last part of our agenda for today, uh, which is about our next steps within digital health uh, here in Japan, and also how you can access uh, the material uh, from the report. So I will just uh, start sharing my own screen. There we go. Yes, uh, so our next steps uh, within Nordic, uh, Nordic activities in Japan within uh, digital health. Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, how you can learn more is to go through uh, the competence center that you can find from Innovation Norway's uh, website. So we have created a video series uh, for you um, it's a free of access where we go through the different parts of the report. Uh, you heard a little bit about it uh, today from Magnus, uh, but there is much, much more to digest. And uh, we have created a series of videos uh, for you to uh, go through. Uh, it's absolutely free of um, charge. Um, anyone can access to it. And you can also download uh, the full report uh, for your review. Uh, the link is, is here, but we will also share all this material uh, with you um, after today's call. And what we're planning for Q4 for um, our activities here in Japan is the Nordic Japan Digital Health Hybrid Summit. Uh, we are living still in these uncertain times, so we want to make sure that we are creating events that are accessible uh, for people, even uh, if it's not able to travel to Japan uh, within uh, this year or, or within Q4. So we will conduct a hybrid uh, summit uh, for digital health companies to meet and connect with Japanese healthcare providers, investors, relevant stakeholders, and we will conduct this together uh, with Japanese healthcare innovation ecosystem partners. Uh, we will mainly be focusing on the areas that we have identified uh, through our study. There will be different types of showcasing opportunities as well as online networking. So we would have both a program as well as a digital networking tool uh, to support uh, this networking happening uh, online. We will start recruiting companies uh, within Q3, so after your summer um, holidays, and uh, all the more details and, and information will be delivered uh, through our social media. So if you haven't given us a follow just yet, uh, please, please do so. Um, if you have any plans uh, towards Japan within this year, uh, please do feel to reach out to us and we can also see if there is opportunities to co-design uh, some parts of the summit uh, together with different clusters and organizations um, from the Nordics. 
Uh, we, of course, uh, would love to welcome you all to Japan as quickly as possible. And, and once that's possible, uh, then we will, of course, uh, arrange uh, digital health delegations as well. Uh, but within this year, um, our main event will be uh, this hybrid summit happening Q4. And uh, please uh, give us a follow to stay up to date with the um, uh, details. Um, but uh, with that, I would like to thank you all so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, within uh, 24 hours of today's presentation, you will have all the material, um, the recording, as well as all the links. Uh, you can also access the Competence Center uh, through reading the QR code that you can see on the screen at the moment. And here are the different Nordic Trade Promotion Office's contact informations. Uh, or you can also reach out directly to Nordic Innovation House and we will then uh, forward your uh, request uh, to the relevant uh, people. But um, with that, I would like to thank you all for joining us. I would also like to give a big thank you to all of our wonderful speakers, um, Otsuka-san, Magnus, Dan and Shimizu-san. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights and experiences with us, um, as well as uh, thank you for Innovation Norway and Business Sweden for allowing this uh, search and, and study to take place, as well as our future activities uh, within this field. Uh, we're going to leave uh, this slide open uh, after the closing the webinar in case you need to access uh, the Competence Center or have a look at any of the contact details over here. Uh, but without further ado, um, I would like to uh, thank you all for joining us today and wish you a lovely continuation uh, to your day. Thank you very much.